The Land of Lakes Country, August 4th, 1989. Fifth annual jazz party. And welcome to Bobby Rosengarten. It's good to see you and hear you. Thank you, Lee. It's nice to be here. I have a, a name that just... Uh, I, I've been waiting to ask you a question about Alvy West and his little band. Oh my Mama God. and Papa Samba. Were you a part of that? Yes. Where in the world... You're the, bo- you're the guy that bought that album. I am the... You're the person. You're the one person that bought that album. Now, that magnificent little band. Yeah. It was a wonderful. Alvy is still alive. He's living in New York City. Uh, you remember he had a small, one arm, he had had a, a birth defect, and he had taken up the saxophone to develop that hand. He is working, I ran into him in the street maybe a year or two ago. He is playing, not professionally, but he's teaching uh handicapped kids who have a similar problem with their hands and or feet teaching them musical instruments so that they can develop you know the muscles that they've got it's a marvelous thing to do he's always was a kind of a uh, an ethereal kind of a person but a marvelous musician and a saxophone player good writer every once in a while i i'm a whistler I mean, I, I walk down the street, some people hum, I go, you know, not most of the time no one could tell what I was whistling, but I, I, have, I hear it upstairs in my head, and f- I find myself whistling some of the things from Alvy West's band, the little band. This was 1947, 46, 47. Hardly a man is now alive or something like that. Uh, Larry Neal was the trumpet player originally. And then, after Larry left, there was a trumpet player by the name of Johnny Plonsky, P-L-O-N-S-K-Y, who then changed his name to Johnny Parker, who is now in Los Angeles, and he does a lot of shows, does the music. Wonderful jazz player. He reminds me, he played the way Warren Vachet plays now, is the way he played then. Uh, Very musical, kind of uh, Bobby Hackett, by root of Big Spider Beck, by root of Louis, and a couple other people. Uh, who else was in that band? Uh, a guitar player, Chuck Wayne, who was in New York. I think he's doing a Broadway show or something. Another guitar player, Al Casamenti, who was in New York. I don't know what he's doing. I don't see him anymore. Bass player was Ward Irwin, E R W I N, who lives in Florida. I think he's working in Orlando. He's down in the Disney World and in the bowels of Disney World playing uh, uh, in a band, one of those bands. Good player. Oh, I, I learned so much in that band. That band had the most marvelous book. And actually, if uh, Stan Getz and um, the Brazilian contingent uh, were really aware, it was Alvy West who premiered the samba. This was, yeah, this was before the sambas came here. I'm funny you should mention your, my love uh, is, is Brazilian music. I went to a movie. At, you, do you know Johnny Pacheco? Do you know the name John Pacheco? Who was a Latin band. Uh, was bef- This was back in the 50s. And we used to work record dates together all the time on percussion. I played bongos and I was always interested in that stuff. And uh, I did all the Harry Belafonte things, those calypsos, you know, the conga drum and bongos. And I was I refer to my playing as Afro-Jewish. <laughs> I always enjoyed it, and I always was interested in the sounds. Anyway, Tito Puente and myself and a whole bunch of us, Willie Rodriguez, who has since died. But Johnny Pacheco said, Bobby, I can't do his accent. He said, Bobby, you should, there's, a, there's a movie that just came out that you must see, a French movie. And I said, what is it called? Black Orpheus. And he says, it's a, you will not believe the music. And I went to the movies. And, you know, uh, there aren't too many times in a man's or a person's life where you can put a little earmark, and that's where things change. That particular day, that particular time, there's a little green flag in my, in my computer in my head. And I s- saw this movie, and I sat through it twice. And I... I was never impressed with anything so much. It was the first time I had heard the song Felicidad, which was uh, Jobim and Bonfa. 
you know, Antonio, Antonio Carlos Jobim and Louis Bonfa wrote this song. They wrote the score. Most of it was Bonfa, but Jobim did a lot of it too. And I never heard drumming like that. I was thrilled. I mean, it was as close to a musical orgasm as you could possibly have. And I m remember going out to all, in New York it was easy to do. I went to all the record stores and they f there was a cast album, you know, a film. And I bought it and wore it out. And a few years later when the, when Stan did the Bossa Nova craze. Now I was, by that time I was out buying records wherever I could find Bossa Novas. The new wave, the new music. And when t Antonio Carlos Jobim came to the United States, and he was unknown, other than the movie, I did two or three albums with him. Wave, the album Wave. Herbie Green is the trombone soloist on that, so marvelous solo, but Jobim. And I was the only American at that time, the only American percussionist who had any working knowledge of Brazilian rhythms, in New York anyway. And I found myself doing, I was the resident American expert, uh, you know, in the land of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. Well, that's what I was, the one-eyed man. And then Bonfa came over, and I did several albums with him. I even wrote some songs with him. I mean, that was thrill of thrills. I wrote some English lyrics to some songs he wrote. He's still alive, so is Joe Beam. I see them very infrequently, and I go to Brazil as often as I can. And that changed my whole life. And uh, I list, I think if I want to, if I want to really clean, clean my mind, cleanse my, my ears, I listen to Brazilian music. Yeah, I recommend it to anybody. There's, there's some singers now, and players of course, there's some singers around. Do you know, are you familiar with the singer by the name of Gail, G-A-L, Casta? Do yourself a favor. I believe, I'm not sure of the label, I think it's Columbia, through Columbia. But she has lots of albums. She's a big star. She comes to the United States infrequently, and she usually goes New York, Los Angeles, and then home. She will knock your socks off. And the most wonderful songs, and the band is incredible. Uh, where our music, our popular music, took a turn to the right, I think of it, uh, through the turns of the right. Their music took a turn to the left. They used the amplification and the various tricks you could do with recording, but the rhythms, with, with all the good parts of rock, there are not that many, but the good parts of rock, uh, the, some of the polyrhythms and the instrumentation, it's the most wonderful mixture a hybrid. It's terrific. I recommend it. Uh, you talked about you, you push the valve here, the little button, because I'm, I feel so strongly about this. A postscript uh, going back to that year 1947. Albie West had spent some time in South America, and when he put this band together, he wrote some charming music. Uncle Samba. No. Uncle, uh, Samba. Uncle Samba. There were some other ones. Mama and Papa Samba. Yeah. I, I, you know, it, it, I still have those records around someplace. Every once in a while, I, the song, there were a couple of songs that, uh, that should be played, but it's not the market anymore. You know, it's like uh, it's hard to get Stephen Sondheim songs played, so why in the world would they play Albie West songs? Bobby Rosengarten, when you were very young and you were presented a drum set and you suddenly faced this battery of percussion and who were your role models? Uh, my mother was a pianist uh, in a silent movie house back in, the, in Chicago in Elgin, Illinois. So I had music around the house and I, I was told, my older sister told me that I used to hit pots and pans with my, with, you know, uh, spoons on the high chair and that kind of stuff. So my mother, there was always music in the house. My father was a civilian. He didn't, he just tolerated all of us. He just said, yes, dear, and that was that. And she, my mother gave me, gave me lessons. There was a, a local drummer, I remember his name, Russ Gady in Elgin. Uh, he was just a, a high school kid, but I thought he was old. And I learned the rudiments of drumming, and then I took to it very well. And I loved, and then when I was seven, I'll never forget this, the year was 1931. My mother t 
took my mother and my father. My father went along because just to pay the bills. Took me to Crystal Lake, Illinois, which was maybe 25 or 30 miles away from Elgin. That's a long trip then. Two-lane highway. To Crystal Lake in the summertime where they had a pavilion outside where the bands came. And Duke Ellington's band was there. I took one look at Sonny Greer and his thousands of drums and damn near died. I, it was the mo now another flag came up, and I never forgot that. And then when I heard other drummers, I, the first time I heard real bands play. In 1938, I heard Benny Goodman's concert at uh, Ravinia. It was wonderful. Uh, I like Gene Krupa because I liked his solos. It was the first time I ever realized that drum solos had form, if they were lucky. There was a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Gene's solos, admittedly, I mean, you realize where he came from, from the drummers, Zooty Singleton and, and, and uh, George Wetley and all those guys, how they developed, and Sonny Greer, and Joe Jones. You could see where he, from whence he came. It was marvelous. And I, and I, I remember that, that I said, I've got to remember that. And that's when I first realized four, dar four bars of drum solos is more than enough. Two distinctly different kinds of environments which you participated in. The sessions with Duke Ellington mm -hmm. and uh, the Miles Davis and Gil Evans sessions. Where in the world did you find? Oh, I know where you found that, in Leonard Feather's book. No? Where? In the uh, new encyclopedias, you yeah. know. Uh, the, uh, those... That uh, Ira Gittler and somebody else. No, the, the, they were the you know the backbone yeah. of the yeah. encyclopedia. But no, I found them in this new uh, uh, large encyclopedia that uh, two volume set. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm struggling for the name. I just blanked out. That's all right. But no, uh, no. Uh, I won't tell either. <laughs> but these two different environments yeah. of that you're the percussionist in a battery of percussion with Duke Ellington recording it for was, CBS. It was the, the era of stereo records. Testing and developing. They were Columbia, and it was at Columbia 30th Street, which was an old church. Yeah. Best acoustics in the world. They ripped it, naturally they ripped it down, put an apartment building on. And I used to do a lot of work. Mitch, Mitch Miller was the A&R man at the time there. And I still work with Mitch. As a matter of fact, I worked last week at the London Symphony with Mitch conducting a Pops concert. And I remember, I remember the at Columbia 30th Street, walking in, and there were, I was the baby of the percussion players. He had, I, Sam Woodyard was Duke's drummer at the time, and he was in pretty good shape at the time. He, he was not sick. And I remember the band all showed up late. Duke's band kind of straggled in when they felt like it. It was that kind of loose band. And all the percussion players were all from the, the New York Philharmonic, NBC Symphony, where I came from, and uh, recording guys, uh, and I played bongos on this thing. It was Duke Ellington party or something. They call a jazz party or something. Yeah, I don't even have the record. I, you know, that's funny. You have a copy of it? It's in reissue and CD and. It is. Oh, I have to get a hold of that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's just a great demonstration of, of the percussion yeah. from left to right. You know, they were panning. Uh, from left to right. I always like that kind of music. I always like I like music. There's uh, that old chestnut. There are only two kinds of music: good music and bad music. That's true. How about the environment? Uh, you sitting in Gil Evans conducting and arranging Miles Davis. The other percussion player was on that uh, Sketches of Spain. Alvin Jones. Alvin was a baby. I mean, he was 16, 17 years old. Uh, Miles' drummer at that time was, excuse, I know Paul Chambers was there, I think. and Elvin and I sat there and hit little toys and little trinkets and things like that. I'm, I'm not a Miles Davis fan. I'm, I'm the one that doesn't really care about it. But I was impressed with Gil very much, you know. I think, I, I'm angry with Miles a little bit. I think that he's putting us all on. Yeah. You can say, it's all right, you can say that. The advantage of being 65, you can just say which, pretty much what you feel. I'm neutral in these occasions. You have to be, yeah. In your heart of hearts, though, you in the middle of the night, if I woke you up and I asked you, you wouldn't tell me, I'm sure. 
I'd confess. Yeah, I think so. There are too many really good players around uh, to put up with that baloney. Uh, anyway, I remember that album and, and thinking to myself, gee, it's a very interesting idea. You know, and I listen to it a couple, I hear it every once in a while on radio. Did you think it pretentious? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it is pretentious. But the music itself being... Uh, uh, the uh, Beautiful. Uh, Rodrigo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's beautifully written. Gil was always a good orchestrator. And I always liked Gil. I always liked his music, and he tried things. That's the reason I... There's an arranger that worked for Doc Severinsen by the name of Tommy Newsom, saxophone player. Tommy does things like that. I think he, if he were hungry enough, he could do things that Gil was doing and then some. I really do. Yeah. I hear, I see, you know, uh, Tommy all once, once in a while. I see Doc all the time. We talk. We're old friends. But I, I came from that radio television band. There were some pretty good players in that band, in that Tonight Show in New York. Doc, the trumpet players, Snooky Young, Doc Severinsen, Clark Terry, and Jimmy Maxwell. The trombones were Willie Dennis, Will Bradley, who just died recently. Uh, I forgot who the bass trombone player was. Jaime Scherzer was the lead alto. Walt Levinsky was the third alto player. Al Klink was the hot tenor player. Newsom was there on the other tenor chair. Bob Haggard on bass, Tony Matola on guitar. Couldn't get anybody. <laughs> it was fun. What a call for a contractor. Yeah. And what a treat for us in the audience. Bobby Rosengarten, filtering through is your philosophy of music, and uh, in 10,000 words or less, you're a percussionist. Sometimes you're a section hand and sometimes you're not. And as you live in this business and survive in it, uh, what philosophically uh, enriches and keeps you going? Oh, I love to play. If I couldn't play, I, 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 I wouldn't know what... I never thought of myself having to get a job. I consider myself very lucky. All of us, all musicians. I mean, Emily Remler is sitting next to us here. Uh, she's one of the new people. And I watch, I watch her play. I also listen to her play. She's a good player. But I, listen, I watch her play, and she likes to play. That's the secret. The one thing I like to do. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's legal. <laughs> you can't get pregnant or AIDS. None of that funny stuff. You just play, and it makes you feel good. It's good for your heart. My doctor says, hey, do it. It's good for your heart. It's good for your feet. It's good for all your parts. I love to play. If I couldn't play, I think I would be very unhappy. I know I'd be very unhappy. I'd be very unhappy. It's done. I, the music business doesn't owe me anything. You know, I owe everything to it. I was at the right place at the right time. Luckily, I was at, there was an era of that's gone now, unfortunately. But all of us, the guy, Milt Hinton and I, we used to work. I, we saw each other more than we saw our children. We saw each every, every day, and we worked. We would do three record dates a day and then have a staff job at NBC. And the money literally came in faster than we could spend it. So you had to accumulate it, and, and unless you were a complete fool, you had to accumulate something so that gave you, you know, money uh, uh, I can't think of the word, I can't think of the polite word about the money that it enabled me to do, but it enabled me to say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm busy. But I don't do that too often because I like to play. Bobby Rosengarten, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>